morning. My name is Lupita Sanchez Cornejo, and I'm chairman of the board of the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce. It's my pleasure to welcome you this morning to the 2022 Hollywood Chamber of Commerce State of the State Address. It's so nice to be back in person after being in virtual the last couple of years. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you for attending, our sponsors, including the Hollywood Museum as a diamond sponsor, and our legislators who are joining us today to tell us about the work that they are doing in Sacramento that has a direct impact in our Hollywood community. And as a special treat, we'd also like to congratulate the Los Angeles Rams for joining us today as we present them with a 2022 Impact Award for their great contributions to the region, to Los Angeles, to Hollywood, and to the state. And thank you for bringing the Vince Lombardi Trophy. I know that it was on tour this summer, and we're so delighted to be a part of that extension of that tour to bring it to the Hollywood community. On behalf of the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors for joining us today. At the diamond level, the Hollywood Museum. At the gold level, LA City's College, Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center, Film Los Angeles, Avail Airlines, and the Pantages Theater. We also would like to thank our silver level sponsors, American Commercial Equities, AT&T, Children's Hospital, Hollywood Hotel, Kaiser Permanente, Paramount Pictures, Sunset Studios, the original Farmer's Market, and UCLA Health. It's Mike O'Keefe, Vice President of the LA Rams. Please join us on stage. At the Hollywood Chamber, it's our, ple it's our pleasure to acknowledge and recognize the great contributions of the LA Rams and to present them with the 2022 Economic Impact Award. Thank you for all you do for our region and for our state. Thank you, thank you. Can I see the trophy? We, we Can you words? Oh. Well, yes. Thank you, Lupita, very much. Uh, really appreciate that. And uh, my name is Mike O'Keefe again, uh, Vice President of Partnership Development for the Rams. And I am joined by our Director of Government Affairs, um, Maria Camacho, who uh, many of us, many of you know and love in this room. So, uh, but really just wanted to say thank you to the Hollywood Chamber for recognizing our efforts uh, on and off the field. Um, on the field, what we just saw here was um, obviously a, a, a Hollywood script, truly a Hollywood script, um, which was amazing and resulted in the players um, wearing the same hats that we were proud to, uh, to distribute to all of you today. So uh, it was a truly amazing, and now our challenge is um, um, writing us the sequel for that. And so um, we, it's gonna be a tall order, but Coach McVeigh and the players uh, have a plan to, uh, as we say, run it forward. So that's where, uh, look, look for exciting things to happen on the field this year out of our team. Um, and then off the field, uh, not much really changes for us. We are committed to continuing to improve the communities of Los Angeles uh, with a focus on social justice, driving equity, and providing access. And so we'll continue to do that across our region and uh, really appreciate the Hollywood Chamber for the recognition today and uh, really privileged to be here. This award's gonna, gonna go great in our trophy case next to Lombardi. So uh, thanks to all of you for having us today. Really appreciate it. Now it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Mary Gallagher, President of Los Angeles City College, also our Hollywood Chamber of Commerce Board colleague, to uh, join us on stage as she introduces our panel. Thank you, Lupita. Good morning, Hollywood. Yes. 
As Lupita said, I'm Mary Gallagher. I am the president of Los Angeles City College and also a chamber board member. Today we're honored to have Fiona Ma with us today as California's 34th straight treasurer. She was elected in 2018 with more votes than any other candidate for treasurer in the state's history. She's the first woman of color and the first woman CPA elected to the position. And California as the world's fifth largest economy has Treasurer Ma as the state's primary banker. Her office possesses more than, excuse me, her office processes more than $2 trillion in payments within a typical year. Also, she's responsible for $93 billion in outstanding general obligation bonds and lease revenue bonds of the state. One committee Treasurer Ma chairs is the California Alternative Energy and Advanced Transportation Financing Authority to help clean and green our state. It is my great honor to introduce to you this morning our keynote speaker, the Honorable Fiona Ma. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, Thank you to the chamber, and I love uh, the Rams rings. If any of you have not seen it up close and personal, uh, they actually open. And inside is a piece, um, from, uh, a piece of leather from the winning ball, and there's also pieces of the turf that are in there. And it's the first Super Bowl ring that opens. And what happens in California happens around the nation, right? We always start the trend, so I love it. So just a little bit about me. Um, I never thought I would be standing here uh, on the stage. I am the oldest child of immigrant parents. Growing up, our parents wanted us to be one of the lead professions, a lawyer, engineer, accountant, or a doctor. So I'm an accountant. My brother's an engineer. My sister's a doctor, and if I had one more sibling, I'm sure they would be a lawyer. <laughs> so growing up, um, my parents, my dad, really trained me uh, on financial literacy, balancing the checkbook, investments, taxes, and I went to the Rochester Institute of Technology uh, to study accounting. Um, we had two paid internships in the Manhattan office, and I did that in the Trust and Estate Department. They offered me a job, but by that time my parents said, we're moving to San Francisco, and I joined them out here, and I started my first job with Ernst & Winnie in the real estate tax group. I stayed five years and left um, to start my own practice at the age of 28 years old, where I became president of the Asian Business Association. And that was the first time that I got involved in politics, representing women and minority small businesses uh, seeking more contracting opportunities. And today, that is still my passion, helping small businesses. Uh, we always say small businesses are the backbone of the economy, economy but it is so hard uh, to run and operate and be successful as a small business owner. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. So I started getting more involved. I got appointed to the Assessment Appeals Board in San Francisco. I joined all the clubs. I started clubs. And I really wanted to run for office. And my parents would say, please don't do that. You're an accountant. You're a CPA. That's an honorable profession. And I would say, well, but I really like want to help people, you know, like just let me, let me try. And my parents would say, well, we think you should go get your MBA. So I got my MBA from Pepperdine University. And then after, you know, they said, well, what do you think? You're going to come back to business? And I said, no, you know, I still want to run for office. And they said, well, you should get married because your younger brother's waiting to get married. And so you need to get married. So I found a nice guy. And then I said, Mom and Dad, I'm 35 years old. Like, please let me just do something for me. And they said, okay, that's okay. You know, we love you. If you don't win, it's okay. You know, you'll go back and do accounting. Uh, and we're going to leave, and we're going to move to Las Vegas. So they left. And I was able to run for um, my first position on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors in 2002. And there were eight of us in the race. 
I ran for the Chinese seat, but before the Chinese were out by the beach and the ocean, it was an Irish seat, Irish um, you know, uh, constituent base. And so I think having a name like Fiona Ma really helped me win my first race, because how many of you vote based on the ballot name sometimes if you don't know who they are, right? So I spent four years there. It was like crabs trying to get out of a, a bucket. I managed to get out and served in the state legislature for six years as the majority whip and speaker pro tem. And then I um, didn't have a seat. You know, redistricting happened in 2010 and my Senate seat was taken away. And so I said, what am I gonna do? And my parents were back from Vegas living with me. And my dad said, this is a sign, go back and do accounting. <laughs> Go make money, you know? What, what are you doing wasting money, right? Mark knows, Mark is the chair of the LA uh, party and he doesn't get paid, right? So I said, no, I'm gonna run for the State Board of Equalization. And so my dad looked it up and he said, oh, okay, tax board, okay, getting there. Um, so I spent four years there. When I was chair, I called three audits because it was very um, you know, mismanaged and the governor took basically all of the tax uh, um, processes away as well as the appeals and then my good friend John Chung who was the treasurer uh, said he was running for governor and I said oh okay well maybe can, I'd like to run for treasurer and he's like great I'll support you and so now four years later as the state treasurer my parents are finally proud of me They don't ask me to go back to do accounting anymore, but this is my fourth elected position. I haven't lost yet, and that's because I think I work harder uh, than most of the other candidates, because that's what it takes. Uh, number two, I don't want my parents to say, I told you so. And number three, I never want to go back and do people's taxes. <laughs> so, as the state treasurer, I am your banker. All of the revenues flow into my office last year, it was $3.2 trillion. Um, I send whatever the controller needs to pay the bills, and then I invest the state's idle funds, as well as the funds for 23 local, 2,300 local government units. The balance is about $228 billion today, and then I issue all the bonds for the state of California, revenue, general obligation bonds, as well as for the UC and CSU systems. And even during the pandemic, uh, the last two years, um, we never missed a beat. My office was open. I had 100 people coming to work every single day. Um, I chair 13 boards, commissions, and authorities that funds and finances affordable housing, hospitals and children's hospitals, charter schools, um, public transportation, advanced manufacturing, green energy, and the likes. And I also chair three savings programs, which I would like to just talk a little bit about. But essentially, anybody who needs money, wants money, comes to me. So I am pretty happy because I'm giving out money, right? Versus my last position as a tax collector where nobody wanted to call me, right? So um, the last uh, four years, as we all know, has been very uh, interesting. Um, my first year, four years ago, the economy was still doing well. California was you know, booming, and then COVID hit. And I think like many of you, we didn't know what to expect. We've never faced this type of situation, a global pandemic, right? I mean, the whole world shut down, which is pretty amazing. And it's just said to me how interconnected we are uh, globally, because we're all traveling and, and moving around so much. And lo and behold, you know, we thought we were gonna be $40 billion in the hole. You know, members of the legislature, that's all we worry about, right? What programs and services are we gonna have to suspend or cut? And we were actually $40 billion surplus. And I was wondering, how could that be, right? When everybody is staying home, everything is shut down. Well, people were still buying and selling stocks. So capital gains was up. Uh, companies were still going public, IPO. They were still offering bonuses and stock options, mostly in the high tech industry. And so we had very, very strong uh, personal income tax, corporate income tax. And because we were all home and we closed that loophole on internet sales taxes, everybody was still buying a lot and still paying a lot of sales taxes. So great. 
Then the second year of a pandemic, I'm like, okay, can't keep continuing, but then we face a $96 billion surplus, and we were able to fund a lot of one-time projects, get a lot of infrastructure, um, projects that have been on hold. Uh, in terms of affordable housing, we rolled out more tax credits and bonds than ever before, and so you'll probably see a lot of new construction uh, for very low and extremely low income individuals built all over the state. And of course, our governor, Gavin Newsom, his priority has been homelessness, right? Tackling homelessness, trying to get people off the streets, whether it's Project Home Key or Project Room Key, and you know, making sure that we build as much affordable housing as we can. But now, because everything is going so well, the federal government wants to slow us all down. Uh, they have increased rates five times just this year since March. It is the most aggressive uh, Fed fund rate increase that we have ever seen. And I think it's slowing things down a little bit, but because we have so much pent up savings, right, we still are spending a lot. And so that's why I think the Feds are, um, you know, thinking about if there's two more meetings left of this year, we'll see whether they are gonna raise rates again to try to slow things down. But our projection at the state is by next year, uh, hopefully inflation is under control, unemployment is also uh, back to the pre-pandemic levels, and hopefully we will get back on track in terms of you know, being able to do what we do here in the Golden State. Um, I love Hollywood. I actually am a SAG AFRA member, and people always say, how are you a SAG member? So when I was on the Board of Supervisors, Willie Brown was the mayor, and he was the mayor for eight years, and he loved movies. Like, he sees every movie. He used to have a column where he would rate, you know, uh, all the movies, and he loved to have everyone filming in San Francisco. And if you live in a small town, even if you live here, you know how hard it is to do filming, right? The neighbors complain, nobody wants it, lights on all the time, overtime, police. But he didn't care because he was the mayor and he said, it's okay. And so we had lots of filming in San Francisco and we all went out and got our, you know, headshots and, and, and got, um, you know, got, uh, you know, our, our agents. And so that's how I became a SAG member. And I haven't made money since I got my SAG card because I started doing other things, but I still pay my dues, right? Because it is important that we have, you know, um, our strong, um, you know, union brothers and sisters making sure that we're all getting paid um, um, and, and all of the benefits. But I love Hollywood. I was on the film commission for two years, got appointed by uh, President Tony Atkins, and was uh, in the legislature when we did our film tax credit 1.0. We are now on our 3.0 uh, film tax credit, and it works, as all of you know. And I'm glad that, I'm glad that our legislature is so um, supportive, as well as the governor, because we need to bring more filming back. As we know, California is the fifth largest economy because of the diversity of the people, like look in this room, and because of our different industries. And I think one lesson learned during the pandemic is that we have to bring more manufacturing back. The fact that we are depending on our drugs coming from overseas or even from the West Coast, the fact that we were bidding for PPE equipment, right, the masks and the sanitizers and just like, you know, in a global competition, um, signal to us that we have to bring more manufacturers, factoring back because if something like this happens again, we need to be prepared and we need to be able to serve our people as quickly as possible. So I'm very, I'm very, yeah. So I just want to mention like three savings programs, uh, ScholarShare 529. How many of you have opened ever a ScholarShare 529? It is the state savings program for college education. Uh, we have expanded the program now where you can use that funds for certified apprenticeship programs. Um, if you have extra money in a ScholarShare 529, it could go to pay down other siblings student loan debt up to $10,000, and it is now 
no longer subject to the bankruptcy laws. So if the parents file bankruptcy, the courts cannot take that scholarship, that scholar share 529 from the kids. And we hope that you will um, partner with us, spread the word, and we have a bonus offer right now. If you open up an account and put $1,000 in it, we will give you $100, but the deadline is today, September 30th. <laughs> But you can also send around a gift link. So instead of you know having people buy all this plastic toys and things that are going to get thrown in the garbage, um, you can send around a gift link and encourage people to donate to your child's college education so they can stay out of high student loan debt. Um, Cal Savers is another uh, board that I chair for any company that now has one or more employee and does not offer a retirement savings plan, you will have to sign up with CalSavers. And this is post like Roth IRA, but really encouraging people to save for retirement. We say set it and forget it. You put a certain amount in and watch it grow. And then my third new savings program is CalABLE. For those who are diagnosed with a disability before 26 years old, that person can now save up to $16,000 in their own name without jeopardizing their other health and safety benefits. And this is creating a, a new sense of independence and peace of mind, not only for the parents, but also that person with a disability. So I thank everyone for all you do, our entrepreneurial spirit, keeping California golden, setting the pace, like with your opening of your, your Super Bowl rings, because that's what keeps uh, California the fifth largest economy, and I'm honored to be your state treasurer. You can call me if you need any help. I will give you my cell phone number, but we are here to serve all of you, and again, thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thank you, Treasurer Fiona Ma. We have in common MBAs from Pepperdine. Ah, now we're going to move on. Oh, by the way, $7 trillion in revenues, and we're just the fifth largest economy in the world? I don't know. I think we need to check those facts. Anyway, that's the great thing about California. Now we're moving on to our panel discussion on the state of the state and how it impacts Hollywood business community. With us today, we have uh, serving as our moderator for our panel discussion is Mr. Alex Michelson, co-anchor of Fox 11 News. He's also the co-host of Fox 11 Special Report, producer and host of the highly acclaimed Fox show, The Issue Is. Alex has conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with nearly every key political figure, including Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Gavin Newsom, Jerry Brown, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and more. Michelson is a winner of seven Emmys, four Golden Mics, and an LA Press Club Award for Outstanding Political Affairs Show. Alex will be moderating the panel, which includes Senator Maria Elena Terrazzo of Senate District 24. Yes, <laughs> representing the new Greater Hollywood District 24, the champion of the working people. Senator Durazzo is one of a handful of senators whose entire district is within the city of Los Angeles. Senator Ben Allen of Senate District 26, yes, who serves on the legislature's Joint Committee on the Arts. He is on the advisory board of the California Film Commission. He chairs the Senate Environmental Quality Committee and the Legislative Environmental Caucus. Assembly Member Laura Friedman, she is, of Assembly District 43, the dynamic chair of Assembly Transportation who has taken the reins of the position and is considered a trailblazer on centering sustainability and equity. And Assembly Member Miguel Santiago of Assembly District 53, who is leading efforts to fight homelessness, to expand childcare, and is passionate about gun safety regulations and the fair and equal treatment of hardworking families. Please welcome our moderator and panelists to the stage. All right, all right, good morning everybody. Thanks for being here. So it's a big day for all of them, 
uh, because in California, today is the deadline for Governor Newsom to sign or veto bills. Uh, so he's like got hundreds of bills that will either get signed or vetoed, including many of their bills. Uh, so thank you for being here on what I'm sure is a nervous day, but an exciting day and a big day. Uh, and uh, let's start off, I think, because the governor usually gets to do this himself and say, what is the state of the state? Um, how would you, since this is the title of, of, of our gathering today, maybe go down the line, how would you describe the state of the state right now in 2022? Senator, let's start with you. Uh, thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you for the invitation, and it's great to be here with my colleagues doing this. Uh, we don't get a chance to share this way with, with each other. Uh, I would say we're in a very good state of the state for most people. Uh, we're in a good state of the state because California is leading on so many climate issues. Uh, I served uh, on the pro Senate Pro Tem's uh, working group on climate with other colleagues, and we really tackled that and uh, worked with the assembly and the, and the governor. Um, housing, really pushing forward on that, uh, at least with regards to, to funding. Um, and I would say something that the treasurer said with regards to manufacturing, um, we're pushing on transportation funding, but in such a way that also creates jobs here, not just moves people or moves goods, but creates jobs here. We've got more to do on, on that front. Um, education, uh, women's rights, protecting women's rights and reproductive rights. There is no state that is doing more. In fact, we're not just taking care of our own, we're taking care of women across the nation. So there's a number of fronts, and uh, I'm very excited and very proud that our governor just signed the farm worker bill. Uh, I think it was such an important show of uh, support for working people and the working poor. So just some thoughts on, I think we're in a great place. We still have to make sure that we are intentionally bringing everybody along and not leaving anybody behind. And we have still a number of, of Californians who have been left behind and we have to do a better job with them. Thank you. And and that farm worker bill, for people that may not be paying super close attention, uh, makes it a little easier for farm workers to unionize, strengthens farm workers' unionization. It was something that President Biden was pushing Governor Newsom to sign. It was unclear whether he would, and he ended up signing it. Uh, Senator Allen, how do you describe the state of the state? Well, I, I certainly agree with everything that, that Maria Elena said. Um, there, there's, and, and Fiona talked a lot about our revenues, how strong our budget's been, the size of our economy, the dynamism of our economy. Uh, but there's certainly some storm clouds as well, not just uh, uh, you know, physically today, but may maybe metaphorically. Uh, the, the disparities that Marilena spoke about uh, are, are way on our economy. The costs are so high, the costs both for, for qual you know, quality of life, to purchase a home or to be able to rent a home, to start up a business. Uh, those continue to be real challenges for us. Uh, there's also, of course, our budget is not going to be in as strong a place next year, almost certainly just because of how the market has been uh, this past year. We're so, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not a, a, an exact apple to apple comparison, but one of the best ways to kind of know where the state of the state budget is, is just to look at the, at the market. And it was so strong. I mean, it was extraordinary. And it does say a lot about our economy and how strange our economy is, that we shut down the economy and yet our, our, the stock market hits record highs. And it speaks to some of those disparities that exist in our society that we need to continue to work on. Uh, but obviously the market's been uh, more of a challenge this year. And I think some of the vetoes that the governor came out with at the end, uh, as painful as they were, I mean, and, and, and he vetoed some really important things from my perspective, but I think it was coming from a place where he's starting to get real nervous about what the budget might look like next year. Uh, I would also say, um, you know, we're, we're incredibly proud of a lot of the successes that have come through the legislature, certainly on the environmental front this last year, very, very important victories. Uh, but, you know, the polarization, our national polarization continues to be a challenge, and it, it certainly finds its way into our, our life as well. Uh, and um, that's something that I think is going to continue to be a challenge that we're going to have to work on together as a, as a community, as a society. Uh, and and um, it's, it's not letting up. And I think we just need to start looking at each other more as fellow Americans, fellow human beings, just trying to all build lives together uh, in our society together. And, um, and, and you know, the more we can all do together to try to see the humanity in each other, the better. Assembly member. Test, test. 
Uh, well, it's great to be here with all of you. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I agree with everything that was said, and I'm not going to repeat it, but I, I guess I'll add that I, I think that we are, as a nation and as a state, also at a time of great transition in a lot of different aspects. I mean, we've seen a very disruptive change with COVID in the past few years, something that I, I don't think any of us really saw coming and s still don't know how it's all going to play out. And a lot of changes in terms of our climate with the wildfires in California, and I hear more, from more, more and more from people, and I, I'm representing this area behind us in the hills, and have a lot of hillside areas, people see what's happening across the state with wildfire, for instance. Their insurance maybe was canceled. There's a lot of changes. A lot of changes coming legislatively, societally, and that leads to a lot of anxiety. And I feel that anxiety with the people that I encounter, our children are feeling anxiety, maybe not having been in school, being worried about sickness for the first time at a young age. My daughter is nine. She had tremendous anxiety over the last few years about COVID. She didn't really know what it was. She went through a period where she didn't want to leave the house. She thought that someone was watching her. And you know, we see it in the way people are driving. A 30% increase in serious and fatal accidents. You know, cars versus pedestrians, people are driving like maniacs. And I think some of that is anxiety related. So. I think that we have a, a lot of, of kind of healing and realignment to come, and these changes aren't over. And you know, some of you are probably brick and mortar real, real um, uh, retailers. Changes in business and the way business works. Are your employees coming back to work? Are they ever coming back to work? Are they still in the office? All of that leads to a time of great uncertainty, and that is something that we all have to grapple with with the changes that we enact. So I, I think it's an an interesting time and not necessarily in a very good or comfortable way either. Assemblyman. Wow, I think she took some of my notes. Um, well, most people know here that I just kind of wing it sometimes, but, um, but, but the reality is I, I see it a little bit differently and it's a little similar at the same time. I think we are in a, in a place of great transition. Uh, and, and I think what happened uh, during COVID in the last couple of years is you've seen a huge divide from some who do very well and some who do uh who don't do as well or, or struggle and, and i'll give you kind of a kind of a point so when we were looking at food lines and we were working on on uh, food distribution pre prior to the pandemic you saw some of our programs at about 100 people a week and then we saw them blow up to about almost 2,000. and this was the norm across the district we saw thousands of people get in line and, and with nowhere to go for work nowhere to go for food no ability to pay the rent, basic groceries that you couldn't pay. I mean, we saw people get in line and the basic thing that they would ask for would be milk to feed their kids. So I'm not gonna paint a rosy picture and tell you, hey, we're doing great, uh, because I don't think that tells what happened in California. Um, so when I say a transition point, it, it's a point, it, you have to reevaluate, we have to reevaluate what works and what hasn't, and for who and for who not. Um, and it's a point I think that we also had to take a look at the paradigms that we have, uh, that we have used, because some of them have not worked, and it gives us the opportunity, and here's the hope and opportunity, that we take a look at the policies that we've put in place, we take a look at the way we've made budgets and decisions, and we reevaluate what works and what doesn't. Because uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, right? The state's invested billions of dollars uh, to tackle homelessness. Is anyone gonna believe that it worked? I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'm gonna say what's on everybody's mind, right? I mean. The, the amount of people who are now living on the streets, the amount of people who can't afford to pay for basic things on the table, the rent uh, that continuously increases on people's paycheck, um, whether you have made a decent uh, uh, salary or not. I mean, I don't, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your, your, your um, um, hands, but who here, you know, who here hasn't felt the pinch of inflation? No matter how much you've made, and I think my colleague hit it, hit it on the nail uh, to my right. There hasn't been an assessment of what sort of, a, what sort of mental health care issues need to be dealt with today that weren't there yesterday. I mean, I, I'm looking at Mary, where I used to work with her we're on the community, uh, when we were on the community college serving there together. And even the students have not come back. I mean, the amount of students who have not come back, the amount, and I bet you when we take a look back, those communities who, who have struggled historically 
are the communities who have least more uh, of, of people now going to those community colleges because there's other pressures on people's time. It's work, it's anxiety, all these other things happen. So look, I, I'll say this, I don't wanna paint a gloomy picture, but I certainly don't wanna say, hey, look, this is great. The economic numbers have shown that we've done so great. Uh, yeah, let's clap you know, and pat ourselves on the back. I think there's serious challenges and with those come some opportunities to redesign what we do uh, to, improve, uh, to improve what we do today. Yeah. Wow. It's very rare that you'll have a politician who says we don't want to pat each other on the back. So that was, uh, that was interesting <laughs> to hear. Uh, and just a note for all of our panelists, if you can keep the mic close to your mouth, I think that'll be helpful for them uh, picking up the audio. So um, there's obviously a lot of topics that we can delve into. One that I think that is sort of obvious because we're literally looking at one of the world's great movie studios right here, and this is the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce is a, for a moment a state of the Hollywood industry. Senator Allen, I know you work so closely on this with the Film Commission. Um, where are we at in terms of attracting Hollywood studios to stay in Hollywood? Uh, I know there's been an investment in that. Uh, the pandemic sort of shaked things up a little bit on that front. Can you give us an update? Yeah, I mean, I think things are, are looking uh, good. I mean, I mean, we have a lot of studio people here, and I'm sure they could kind of tell kind of, run us through uh, both the, the pros and cons of the current market. But um, you know, the TV film tax credit was very important. I think we knew that we didn't have to offer something that would, you know, that would match what every jurisdiction in the world was, was putting up. But we needed to do something. We needed to do something meaningful. And we've seen that, that by putting up an, a, a tax credit, and of course, it was an interesting battle within labor. Um, you know, because the, the public sector unions typically are very skeptical of any sort of tax credit or tax cut. And yet, of course, within the Hollywood unions knew how important this was. Uh, and, and we were ultimately able to get it passed. Of course, Jerry Brown was, was you know, kind of famously chintzy. He doesn't like tax credits. And, and, um, and, and we got it through. And of course, the, you know, this, this report, the study just came out earlier this year that showed that 2.0, so the, the prior version of the, of the tax credit program, had created 110,000 jobs, uh, over $7.7 .7 billion in wages, and, and, and $21.9 billion in economic output during its five years. We now have the 3.0 program in place, and uh, you know, we just got 57 applications. I think there's 18 projects that were just approved by our commission, and we're estimating you know, $915 million in overall production spending across the state, and you know, similar types of numbers of output. Uh, we, you know, we're seeing you know, there's, there's not enough soundstage space. Uh, that's both a, 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 you know, an infrastructural limitation that we're trying to address, and Senator Portentino has been taking the lead on, on a bill to help to address that issue. Uh, but it also is reflective of how much generation and how much interest there is in, in, in the next generation of production. Uh, so we're paying very close attention to these issues, and, and certainly one of the things I, I think I, I can speak for all my colleagues when I say, please come talk to us, engage with us, talk to us about ways that we can be helpful to this industry we, that we know is such an important part of the lifeblood of this city and such an important part of, of, of the economic output of this region. Uh, so I, I'm feeling optimistic from all the things I've been seeing, but I know that this is, I know there's a lot of other places around the world who want to steal our production and, and, and get a bit of our Hollywood magic, and, and, and we need to continue to fight to, to keep it here. And that's why we need to extend and expand the TV film tax credit. Uh, you know, we, we, there was a proposal that was on the table during this last session, we're going to renew it, and, and, and I want all of us to be engaged in that discussion, and we all need to come together to make that case to, the, to our friends from all over the state, who quite frankly see this as an L.A. thing, uh, about why this is actually a California thing, why this is actually something that is so important for our entire state. And, and Assemblywoman Friedman, I know you got your start sort of in this industry as well. How does that shape your perspective on this, and what are you hearing from the industry in terms of what they need? Thanks, yeah, I spent uh, about 25 years as a studio and development executive uh, and a producer, so I do know the industry, and actually I, back, I was just talking uh, uh, to someone about this today, back in the 90s, and I'll age myself, I remember when we started sending shows to Canada because of their film tax credit program. So I was part of doing that calculus and looking at the savings of shooting out of state uh, shooting out of the country, actually, and then move shows to North Carolina and other places. So I do understand the price pressures when you're producing content. You know, not everything is a winner. Most of, a lot of our productions are losers, and so you're always trying to find ways to hedge your bets. Uh, I can tell you that as someone who represents a lot of people in the, in the industry, my friends, my neighbors, having them be able to stay home has been hugely important for them in their personal lives. And not having to go to shoot for six months, seven months, eight months, or a year out of state and leaving their families behind is a, is a, 
important for them and their families, also for all of the businesses that rely on having those productions local. And I love seeing all of the, I love that, you know, when you say, oh, God, another, another shoot in my neighborhood, you know, I'm like, yay! Uh, so I love seeing the production trucks around. Um, that's Hollywood. That's what people come here for. It's part of our tourism industry. It, it, it's why I came to Los Angeles. I, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't gotten a job at Paramount. That's why I'm here. So uh, I think that our community absolutely understands that and, and supports it. And it's peak content, you know, and that ebbs and flows as well. So I do think about what the long-term business model is for the studios. We have the tech industry in California as well, and so much of production now and film production is tied in with the tech industry in terms of the technology that's used to make content and distribute content. So I do think, and I think it's a, again, a time of some disruption. I hope that the studios are looking seriously at what's happened to one of my companies in another state where maybe they walked into an environment that wasn't as politically friendly as they had hoped. You know, they will always have a friend here in California and a state that aligns with the values of the people that are creating the content generally as well, where we can be proud that we're shooting in California in a state that does uh, protect women's rights, and protects uh, and values diversity and all the things that I think are important to so many of our content creators that we reflect that. So staying, keeping those productions here at home also keep you from walking into situations where all of a sudden you're shooting in a state that are criminalizing people who are providing medical care um, to trans youth or to women who need to terminate a pregnancy. Uh, that's not gonna happen here in California. So you're saying that the red state tax credits might not be as attractive as they used to be. I think there's a lot of yeah. reasons to shoot here. We certainly have the yeah. best crews in the world. We've got a hospitable environment. We have a supportive public. And we have the right, I think, uh, uh, political outlook yeah. um, to, for, for what we need for our industry. And Senator DeRaza, one of the things you really focus in on is the budget. How do you balance that priority with everything else that's going on uh, when it comes to the budget? Well, I think what's most important uh, about the Hollywood industry is that the number of great, good, middle-class jobs and careers that are created. When the issue first came up in the legislature, um, the pushback was, why should we give tax breaks or any kind of subsidy to all these wealthy people? because it was the celebrities or it was the studios. We had to change that mindset and remind everybody in California that these are tens of thousands of incredible careers that where you can raise a family, you have the, the benefits that you need. It's strong middle class jobs. That's why we passed. That's why we're successful in passing the film, uh, the tax credit year after year, third year. So I just want to remind us that's what was the the guts of it. I do want to um, identify the continuing challenge, which is the hiring of women and people of color. We have to do a better job. This provides the mechanism to be able to track that uh, uh, and, and do a better job. Uh, but we do have to continue to work on that because this incredible economic opportunity ought to be opened up to everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, Assembly member. Santiago, uh, when people think of Hollywood, they think of the studios, but then increasingly, they also think of homelessness and crime, unfortunately. Um, what more can be done from a legislative perspective to make people feel safer when they come to one of the number one tourist attractions in the world, and then they get there and they're, some people are horrified with what they see? Well, here's where I'll start off, right? If you're, if you're talking about the topic of homelessness, right? I mean, I, one is accountability on the dollars that we do. Because we, uh, we at the state level don't have direct access to local municipal decision making. So let, let's just put that on the table. Probably should. In some cases, uh, we step in as it relates to housing policy. In some cases, we, re we uh, step in as it relates to um, uh, local conservatorship laws, et cetera, just to give you an example. So, we, so, so I want to I say that from the beginning. But I, I, on the issue of homelessness, one of the things I think we need to do, and we struggled with this, uh, is, is put in more ironclad accountability on the dollars that we, that we send. That's one. Two, and I don't always feel like there's a, that sort of, and when I talk about not collaborative relationship between counties and cities, I'm not picking on LA. That's not, you know, let's not say that. But what I'm saying is there seems to be a tension between state interest and local uh, local municipal interest as it relates to dollars. 
uh, and as it relates to laws and it relates to things that we do. So oftentimes we may have a some uh, you know legislative uh, endeavor that we want to do, and it butts up against what the locals will want. And, and I'll give you a clear examples, right? You know, uh, earlier this year, you know, we wanted to do uh, an audit uh, on local dollars that are being used in homelessness. Now we ran out of time, and there wasn't a, uh, a committee that would hear it because we ran out of time. But there was a lot of pushback from the locals not to do an audit. I mean, that would be basic 101. Let's do an audit to see what works better. Uh, when we've done, um, my colleague and I have worked on homelessness uh, a significant amount of time. But when we did, okay, let's, let, let's talk about the governor's um, Cal Court. Probably one of the most innovative. Uh, Care uh, Court, right? Care Court, yeah, yeah. Care Court. I was thinking Cal Court. There you go. Care Court. There was an immediate pushback from local municipalities. You know, it, it, and that, that is a bit of a problem because usually the and, solution. And why don't you, real quickly, for people that may not follow it, describe what Care Court is sure. in like 30 Care seconds. Care Court, what it says is if, if, you're our, if you're that small population that is homeless and has severe mental health care issues, um, you could be, it, this is a high level, you could be referred to what's called Care Court. The courts would determine whether you need help uh, and whether it requires holding somebody up to 12 months for that help. So it, it's a real game changer. We worked on conservatorship laws over the last several years. My, my colleague and I, uh, Ms. Friedman, I always say my colleague, I should just call her by her name, right? Ms. Friedman. Um, and what, what you find out very quickly is the amount of pushback from local municipalities. And, and I could recall the argument saying, you know, well, if you send more money, we're going to take care of the problem. That was always a problem. In fact, we engaged, uh, I keep pointing at you, so I apologize, but I'm going to keep doing it. Uh, we engaged in an audit. And this, and this audit is, is unique. Back in 2019, we, we asked for an audit on some of the conservatorship laws. Because if you recall, um, I was trying to, we were trying to change uh, conservatorship laws to talk about those who had uh, grave mental uh, disabilities, not because it was cruel we wanted to hold somebody against their own will, but because we thought uh, that if somebody is banging their head up against the wall that they need help, and if they're not seeking the help themselves, then we should help them get that help, even if it's against their own will. And it was really contentious, right? Some newspapers beat us up, others loved us, we had pro people protesting, etc. cetera. Um, moving forward, we called for an audit uh, on what's happening in conservatorship. Now, I'm going to say numbers off the top of my head, so if I get them wrong, I'm not trying to fudge numbers. I'm just, hey, look, every politician doesn't memorize all their talking points, so here we go. But, but, but bear with me to the message. We took a look at how many, over the last 10 years, how many people were held uh, in the LA County region. So if I get the numbers wrong again, it's about 143,000 people were held. Of those, I think like 10% of the population, 10% of the people, or 10,000% 10, of 10,000 people were held over 10 times. But this number that was really striking was about 50 of those people were held over 100 times. But what was even, what was even more striking is that they were held released with no plan. And you go back and take a look at the audit. I think we got briefed on it. The first reaction from the, from the county departments were like, no, that's not accurate. That's not accurate. You know, no, it is accurate. The state auditors just did this audit. It is absolutely accurate. So what that means is for that person who needed that, that help and was hospitalized, because that's what happens for about 72 hours, they were released. And that's why you kept hospitalizing the same people over and over. But there was no plan. There was no engagement. There was no, and I'm getting to the point, but it's long-winded. But you asked me, but you know, I'm giving you an example of one particular piece, right? So we came back this year, and and some of you followed, and my colleague and I worked on, on this to try to change some of the definitions outside of uh, outside of care court, to say that you could use um, MHSA dollars for voluntary and non-voluntary, and that you would have to have a a plan for individuals once they were held for their own welfare. First, first folks who were up to oppose were counties, you know, saying, well, you know, we don't want to use these for involuntary holes. We only use them for voluntary holes. Will you tell me, because you've been dealing with this issue for so long, how, how many people who need severe mental health care help voluntarily say, I want help? And so once they're, once they're in that particular situation, look, it's, it sounds wrong to hold somebody against their own will, but, but, but if that population of people need that help, then we should give them the resources. And, and, and for me, it was, it was just mind boggling how you would fight that. You know, like, we're trying to help people. And it was all about the dollars. So you're asking me a question specifically, but I, I, I answered in a way to say, to, to relate to the first comment that I, that I said, which is we need to change the paradigm on the way that we do things, because it just can't be about money. Right, to this whole idea of like insanity, right? Of, 
literally doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Uh, and, and, and Assembly Member, how do you think that the care court system could potentially be a game changer uh, going forward? Because it's going to be, well, it's Assembly Member Friedman, I should say. Uh, how do you think that could change things going forward? And what does that mean specifically for everybody sitting here? So for, for this population, those 72-hour holds are almost useless. Uh, they will, will remove someone out of immediate danger or the public out of immediate danger. And to be clear, those 72-hour holds are only for people who are in extreme crisis. You know, these are people that are being arrested and taken off the streets. Uh, the folks who maybe are wandering around with a knife in their hand or threatening to kill them, you know, standing on a bridge threatening to kill themselves. But if you, if you hold them for 72 hours without any treatment at all, without any plan to put them in treatment, you're just putting them back into the exact same situation, which is why they're, you're, you're seeing them over and over again on the street. So we know that it doesn't work. My hope is that the Cal Court will, care court, it's so hard. It's like a tongue twister. We'll at least put the, the, the infrastructure into place to offer some sort of sustained care. And to be clear, our conservatorship laws are not just for people who don't have resources and need state help. Our witnesses on the bills that we did together were actually the parents of young people who were young people in the throes of schizophrenia, which usually does present in late adolescence, early adulthood who had the means to take care of their own children, but legally couldn't remove their children from the streets and put them into their own care. So the laws fail this population. And you know it's, it's one thing to talk about somebody having a choice of living on the streets, but these are people that in our, in, under our legislation, the court would have had to say that they have no, they have no, um, ability to make these sorts of basic life decisions for themselves. And my, my feeling is you either believe that there's such a thing as mental illness or you don't. And if you believe that there is severe mental illness, you have a responsibility as a society to provide care and treatment and protection for that population. And the bill, the bill had said that that not only, and, and to tell you how limited our bill was, it said that not only would a court have to determine that the people were too mentally ill to make their own decisions, they also had to have an underlying medical comorbidity that was so dire that without treatment they would be dead from that underlying comorbidity. So we're talking about people who have untreated diabetes, heart disease, cancer, who are literally dying on the streets in front of us and who are too mentally ill to make their own decisions to treat themselves, who advocates would say they have the choice, that's their choice. I'm sorry, I reject that. It's one thing if you, you know, are mentally capable of explaining to a court while you're making the decision that you're making, but if you don't even know where you are, and many of these people couldn't articulate where they were physically or who they were, the fact that we, that we only have a 72-hour hold for those people and that the, the care providers will tell you who will be dead within a year. They can identify them, and we allow them to die on our watch. That's not, hum that's not humane, that's not California values. So my, my hope is that the new system will develop the infrastructure to actually care for this extremely vulnerable population, and that for people who just need help, who are clearly not living in a way, you know, on the streets and in a way that, you know, we know that they need to be supported. And I'll just say one last thing. If you're a drug addict and you choose to get treatment, it's hard for you to get off drugs. That's how addictive this new class of, chemical, of substance is. It's designed to be that addictive. Somebody who's not even there yet or who's got mental illness on top of it, they need that extra help. They need us to give them that treatment even if they don't necessarily want it themselves. I think that you know, not treating that as a disease and not giving them every opportunity to live a life that is not humane. I don't think that's California values. All right. <laughs> Senator Allen, let, let's talk a little bit broader, maybe not just on homelessness, on the issue of tourism, uh, which is so important, of course, for Hollywood and, and the industry people coming here. How can we make it more attractive and more safe for people to visit Hollywood? Yeah, I, I think... Um, uh, First of all, I think we, I mean, all, building on all the stuff that's been mentioned, um, we also need to figure out an, a new way of policing. Uh, obviously, we've had major discussions as a society about the role of police and the, some of the racial injustices that exist in policing. I also think that we, we've also, uh, the, the vast majority of us, 
don't want to dismantle the policing system. We want to strengthen it, do it in a way that's more compassionate, more progressive, more inclusive, uh, and, and, and fairer. Uh, I think our, our metro, for example, we, we, we invest so much money in that beautiful system, that beautiful subway system, and yet it, it is so unsafe for people to ride. Uh, and, and we need to get more presence on the, on, the, on the subway so that people will feel more comfortable riding. I mean, it, it, you know, I, I, I'm passionately supportive of building out our public transportation system. And I think it's going to be what's going to bring LA into the, the league of civilized great cities uh, around the world. I go to other places, London, you know, New York, Washington, DC, uh, where they have these strong systems where, where you truly have people from all walks of life sitting together on the subway, going to work, students sitting next to Wall Street bankers. You know, that's the kind of pluralism I think we need on our subway system. And yet when you go uh, onto the red line or the purple line, people, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's folks who can't afford a car who are there, and, and they're quite frankly scared. Um, and, and so I think we, we really need to, to, to redouble our investment in safety uh, on, the, uh, on, on, on the subway lines. And I think that's going to make a big difference for tourists, too, visiting Hollywood. Hollywood's so, so well served by that subway, and yet so underserved when it comes to a safety perspective. So I, I, I really, you know, I'm hopeful we get, quite frankly, I'm, I'm personally hopeful we get a new sheriff. Uh, uh, you know, someone who's really going to uh, kind of work closely with our officials at the county. Um, and, but, I, but I do hope moving forward with the new mayor and, and a new administration, uh, both at the county and at the city, uh, that, that we're going we're gonna to double down on a new vision for policing that will, that will, that will meet the, the moment of the George Floyd summer while also increasing public safety. And that's really where we have to go. Well, it was interesting. Last night um, on the Fox 11 News special report, which airs every night at 6 o'clock, uh, we had Sheriff Villanueva in the studio, and he, I asked him of all the areas, of all the things, what's your number one priority? And he said Hollywood and public transportation in Hollywood is his number one priority for the next four years. So it's interesting that that's what he brought up. Senator, I know public transportation is a big passion for you, something you've worked closely on. What is coming up on that front from a state level that may be applicable to everybody here? Well, um, we worked really hard to increase and take advantage of our surplus to increase the amount of money we're investing in public transportation. Public transportation has got to be something that everybody feels comfortable in taking. Everybody's got to be able to take it. And that's going to make a difference. Public transportation is not just about moving people. It's about moving goods because vehicles are the largest contributor to contaminated air in this, in this state. We have to do something about that. But at the same time, we create really good middle class jobs, both with the construction as well as the maintenance and operations of it. But we also have the opportunity, as our treasurer said, to create manufacturing opportunities, clean manufacturing opportunities, because we can build the electric buses here. We can build the trains here. We can do anything, everything that's needed in uh, those products. That's what we can do here. So to me, it really addresses that. The short-term issues of uh, safety and our homeless, we have to address that as, as well. That can't be something we just uh, push aside. They're, not all homeless have the same issues. You know, some have become more recent um, homeless. Some are on the brink of homelessness. We have, in my district, um, uh, severe overcrowdedness, severe. They're not counted as, as homeless. Um, and we have to address all the different phases of becoming homeless and have the services for them. Uh, we were able to put uh, money into Supervisor Solis's project, the Restorative Village. Uh, we worked really hard to get that because we don't have the beds for the mentally ill. We just don't have them. So we push on one end with programs like um, uh, the CARE program, but if we don't have the beds, where are they going to go? We can't wish them away. And so uh, that's for the more severe, but there's different um, levels. It's also about preparing them to get jobs. Uh, with business, two years ago, we passed the homeless hiring tax credit. Um, people um, who become homeless who are able to start getting the services and get training and apprenticeship programs, they have to see that in their future, there's a way to get back on their feet. If all we're saying to them is, come here and get a room at the hotel, at a motel, where, where's, where's the hope for them? Why should they believe that things are going to change any, any, uh, any more for them? They need to know that there's a real path to them getting back on their feet. And that means a good job. 
So the homeless hiring tax credit was to help both employers willing to invest the time, but also to give homeless people with the services. And I think that's our biggest challenge is we have to have all the services, the beds, the housing that our homeless need to get back on their feet, not just say, get off the streets. It's such a complicated issue. Thank you. Um, as we run out of time, I want to try something that I sometimes do on our show, uh, which is a segment that I, that I stole from the old Chris Matthews show, which is called Tell Me Something I Don't Know, uh, which he used to say scoops and predictions from our panel. Uh, there's so much that happens in Sacramento that doesn't get covered well um, and that a lot of people don't know about but is really important. Um, so uh, maybe we'll go down the line since we went this way before, maybe we'll come this way, of maybe one thing that you think more people should know about here uh, that's especially interesting or like a scoop and prediction of what's to come. Uh, assembly member, let's start with you. Tell me something I don't know. The amount of time it takes to convince people on a contentious bill and the amount of work and phone calls it takes and the amount of time you spend with an individual. So some of those big bills that you see, people are literally spending 40, 50 hours just on that one bill alone per week to get it out of a committee, to get it out of a house. It takes a tremendous amount of time. And so then if that gets vetoed today in the midst of everything for three seconds, how does that feel? How do you process that? Well, I, when I first got up there, I was like, oh, offended and mortally wounded. Then you realize it's just part of the process, and you come back next year, and you figure out how to get it done. Yeah. Uh, as assembly uh, woman, tell me something I don't know. This is hard, because uh, I don't know what you know. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, you know, just because I'm thinking about it, I'll just say this, and I don't know what you all think, but when I was sitting here listening to the conversation about homelessness, and also thinking about, as the, as the chamber, about how hard it is sometimes to hire people, and I think it's because if you're paying even like $25 an hour starting wage, people can't afford to live in the area on that. So to me, housing is one of our biggest crises and we just need a lot more housing. We need beds for people that are homeless. We need housing at every single level and we can't keep having people live in, you know, San Bernardino and expect to come here for a starting, you know, $18 an hour wage. So what I was gonna say that people don't know and maybe some of you fall into this camp, the number of people who live in our community, and a lot of in our single family neighborhoods, people who are very politically active, who do not believe that there's a housing crisis, who believe that there are tens of thousands of empty units, that it's all sort of manufactured, and just have a major disconnect between what young families are facing, what, uh, what renters are facing, and just tell us over and over again as policymakers, how dare you try to set the stage for more housing to be built in Los Angeles or anywhere near where I live. And I know the chambers have done a really good job trying to re-educate and push back and on that and support the production of more housing, but I wish more people understood that, that even the connection between homelessness and a lack of housing, people argue with me constantly that there is any connection between the two things. And I will tell you, in case you're one of those people, there is a huge connection between the ability to afford rent and ending up on the street. Senator Allen, tell us something we don't know. Uh, I, well, <laughs> there's so much that, I mean, there's so much that goes on up in Sacramento. And I, quite frankly, there's so much attention that goes toward Washington, D.C. And, and local government. And, and yet, there's so much that's happening in Sacramento that gets so little attention. The, the number of, of, of of reporters has plummeted up there uh, over the past few decades. Uh, one area that I think is going to be uh, an area of really fascinating uh, but of great importance is the area of energy. Uh, you know, it's something that I'm, everyone knows a little bit about, but probably uh, nowhere near the complexity of, of, of all the issues that we're grappling with. You know, we're, we're very proud of the climate bills that have passed, uh, and we're certainly trying to chart a path toward a greener energy future. Uh, and yet, we've got uh, climate change is, is both something we're trying to, 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 to slow down, but it's also uh, something we're also trying to mitigate against the effects of. And climate change is creating all sorts of new liabilities and challenges, uh, longer, uh, uh, you know, far fewer uh, uh, you know, you know, rains, you know, more drought, more uh, fires. Uh, we're asking our utilities to go deeper and deeper into the woods, into, into very volatile areas to service people who are living further and further out in the hinterlands because they can't afford to live in the cities and because we're, we, we don't seem to differentiate in zoning between uh, very high fire risk zones and, and those, where we, those areas where we should be encouraging housing. 
Uh, that's creating all sorts of new liabilities for the utilities. Our rates are going to go up as a result because they're having to pay for the, uh, the fires that are caused when, when, uh, when things go wrong, even when things work as they're supposed to and the transmission lines cause a fire. We're also trying to struggle with how to build out a, 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 a truly electric grid infrastructure that will be able to handle all of the needs that we're going to be placing on that infrastructure from, from charging the, the, the whole new generation of, of cars and automobiles to trying to switch over uh, all of our fossil fuel-based uh, energy sourcing to electricity. And we're actually making incredible progress. And even during this last uh, uh, surge where we had incredible heat just a couple weeks ago, the system stayed resilient uh, and our batteries kicked in in a way that I think really out show, out, out, outpaced our, our initial expectations. But we know that we need to continue to really uh, grow that, uh, uh, that, that space of battery storage. So there's going to be a lot of work in this area, regionalization and transmission lines. Uh, but it's, it's a space to spend some time looking at because it's really going to impact our, our longer-term growth goals as we try to meet our climate goals. Finally to you, Senator. I know I'm getting the signal back there. Um, I would say two things. One is that your involvement and the people's involvement is really, really important. Should never make less of contacting, visiting, doing um, your outreach. Um, that's how I found out about the need to put money into Hollywood beautification project, you know, to be able to, uh, you know, give something like $800,000. What a difference it will make. But that's because of your in involvement. And second, I don't think anybody understands how much we have to try to learn in order to make the best decisions possible. Something along the lines of what Assemblymember Santiago said is just what Senator Sa Allen said right now, think about each of those subjects and to try to understand it and try to come up with solutions is very complicated and difficult, but we're, we're up for it. Thank well you said. all. You know, it's... it's it's interesting that nobody said in their scoop and prediction that uh, Gavin Newsom is running for president. But uh, if, zero if, interest. We heard you were. <laughs> By the way, good oh, job on the mayoral debate. Oh, and the thank you very debate. much for people there's, that watch that. Yeah. There's, there's still a few hours left before he vetoes the rest of the bills. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so thank you guys for listening. I mean, the most important thing, of course, is to get involved. Uh, November 8th is the last day to vote. I hate when people say that it's election day because now we have an election month. Get involved, get people active, Yay. let people know about what's happening. I'll do one plug for myself because I'm around a bunch of politicians, so I got to self promote for a second. Yes. Uh, we do a, a, a show, which is California's only statewide political show, it's called The Issue Is. It airs every Friday night at 10 30 on Fox 11. Set your DVR, or you can watch it on YouTube or Tubi, or as a podcast as well. We dig into a lot of these issues tonight. We've got the chair of the Republican National Committee, Ronna McDaniel. We also have got this really interesting. Um, a congressional candidate named Will Rollins, a Democrat who's running um, as well, and, and hopefully in the weeks ahead we'll have all these folks on as well to talk about these important issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming out here today, and thank you for listening to all of us. We really appreciate it, and uh, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Alex. Let's hear it again for our panel. They did a wonderful job. We appreciate you spending the morning with us. A special thank you to Alex Michelson of Fox News for emceeing today's panel discussion. And I'd also like to thank State Treasurer Fiona Ma for delivering today's keynote address. Thank you to State Senator Ben Allen, State Senator Maria Elena Durazo, Assemblymember Laura Friedman, and Assemblyman Miguel Santiago for joining us today in the discussion. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our Hollywood Chamber of Commerce team for producing today's event. Hope that you enjoy the sessions and look forward to more programming like this throughout the year.